Yeah, I am very much looking forward to this event because I think that, right, in the spirit of community organizing. Also, just like, hi, y'all. My name is Brian. My pronouns are she, her. I am a trans femme person based in Ohlone Land, Oakland, California. Um, a little bit of background as we were kind of talking, I do a lot of community organizing out here in the Bay Area. And I think that community is so vital and it is so integral and is the main thing pushing us forward towards like you know feelings of like safety to like thrive and also just like a sense of like liberation too I genuinely don't believe that like it, us as individual people are meant to feel and we're not able to feel like the full scope of emotions and so when we're experiencing a grief that is like the world as it is type of grief like we are supposed to be with other people in order to feel and like widen the scope and like the capacity of what we are able to access in terms of like emotions, you know, because like my grief doesn't look the same as Sam's grief that doesn't look the same as Alex's grief. And uh, with those like grieving aspects intertwined with each other, it's like we're able to feel more. And the feeling is the thing that leads us towards action, you know, like, it's like grief that is immovable leads to like depression but grief that is shared with others leads to action and so I feel like it does feel really important for you know just events like this to exist and talking about right as we're talking about things happening after like the elections and the pains that have been ongoing for a long time and that the pains and the struggles that will continue on in the future it feels really important to talk about what is like bodily autonomy and like trans issues and the intersectionality of it all. How does it really impact everyone? Because it does impact everyone. And how do we show up and broaden our understanding of what community actually means so that we can like really show up for each other and do the work to keep each other safe and to get to a place where we're no longer struggling, but we are like thriving. I, you that is my piece. Are <laughs> such an eloquent speaker of such like such integral and complex subjects that I, that was so beautifully said. Thank you. Also, that's Thanks. like basically exactly, that's like a solid like you conclusion just, you just or did the thesis statement we of like what we're going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> like, like that is basically half, like, like uh, you'll see, I mean, you will see, but you were just saying something about not having, you know, taking the, the camera off of yourself and that you aren't part of these presentations. You just showed us once more that you truly are because that was wonderful. And thank you so much. Thank you all. I appreciate y'all. <laughs> We're here to pump you up, right? Anyways, <laughs> enough about me. So <laughs> we have Transformations Project here. <laughs> Two amazing, amazing organizers and just like beautiful people in general. I would love for Sam and Alex to introduce yourselves if you want to. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Alex Petrovania, and I am, we actually have an update for this slide, which is exciting. It's a very exciting update. The board of the Transformations Project officially voted to make Sam a co-director with me, which is enormously deserved, and I am so excited about that. Additionally, we are shifting, I guess, the messaging in terms of how we describe founding the org, because uh, fundamentally, no person is ever up you know, a single founder of anything. That's not how anything works. We've called me the founder up until this point because it was my idea, but literally within a week, I went to Sam and I said, hey, you wanna help me build this? And she said, yes. And she has been here since the beginning. So to reflect going forward, we are equal co-founders and co-directors at this point. And I am so thrilled about that. So I just wanted to add that note. We also have a little, Thank you, Ryan. You're the lovely. <laughs> I so uh, appreciate it. Bam. Yeah. Yeah. Super exciting. And uh, we have our own little intro slides in our presentation that have just like a couple of our identities. So we'll, we'll have that in a minute. Sam, do you have anything to add? I don't think we actually introduced ourselves. We just edited the introduction that we exist. Hi, I'm Sam. She, they, co-founder and co-director of the Transformations Project. I'm the one who does the database. 
We are primarily an organization that tracks anti-trans legislation, and that's why we are here, and one of the many reasons we are here to talk about stuff. And I am the one who's primarily in charge of the database, as far as that is my main role, I suppose. Yes. Yes. Okay. To expand upon that and actually introduce myself. Thank you, Sam. I am the one who kind of heads our narrative and messaging and rhetorical analysis. The Transformations Project was founded in 2021. And since 2021, we have tracked anti-trans bills in every state and nationally in the United States. We, every single bill that we track, we have a plain language description written of exactly what that bill would do, written by actual human beings and not AI tools or any of that nonsense. And uh, we also publish a newsletter once a week that details everything that went on in the anti-trans legislative crisis in the United States that week. And we've been publishing that since April 2022. All of those archived newsletters are available on our website. And the really important part of our organization that I just really want to underline is that um, we are a community trans-centered grassroots collective. We are not a traditional nonprofit. And I do believe very strongly in both our mission and in the way we choose to achieve it. So thank you so much for being here. It is beautiful to be in community with all of you. And I'm really excited for this. So beautiful. Thank you so much, Sam and Alex, for amazing introductions. And also congratulations, Sam. That's so exciting. I'm really happy for you. I'm terrible at accepting compliments, but thank you. That's why we got to compliment them more. Yeah, Yeah, that's especially publicly and live (laughs) (laughs) in front of Uh, an audience of other 60 people. Love it. (laughs) A little bit more about this event, you know, just for quick housekeeping. So, you know, it's going to be about an hour long, like plus or minus with a Q&A at the end. Just want to acknowledge that this is a very activating and emotionally, emotionally turbulent time right now. We are all impacted by the harms of the systems around us. And so, you know, some parts of this topic will feel quite activating. It might feel a little triggering. Wanting to like hold that tender space while also providing you as much like information and resources in order to make empowered decisions. And so with that, I am going to send some resources over Trevor Project and the Trans Lifeline so that, you know, if there's any types of like heavier emotional support that you're needing, those are the places that can support you. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to all of y'all beautiful people to such a presentation. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you so much. All right. I'm going to share the screen. Everybody can see this. Yes. Yes. I can. Wonderful. Okay. All right. Alex, you're the opener usually. Go ahead. That is true. All right. Thank you so much, all of you, for being here. Yeah. A lot has happened in the past <laughs> the past little bit. I'm sure everyone else can relate when I say I feel like I have aged a year in the last week. And now is the time to lean back into community. Um, you know, always is the time to lean back into community. But if you are searching for something that you can't seem to find, it's probably community. Yeah, so we are really excited to have you here. We are really excited to be able to discuss this topic that uh, with the election results has become even more critical, which is the intersections of bodily autonomy and trans autonomy, which are you know, fundamentally the same issue. So really what this presentation is going to be about is about how reproductive justice and trans liberation are fundamentally the same struggle and how recognizing that and operating from that understanding can help us to move forward and also help us to not only find and make meaning in what is around us at this moment, but create and create and dream and fight for a better world that we want to see. So next slide, please, Sam. This is our content warning slide. We have a lot of heavy topics in this presentation, and we really do value making sure that anybody can take the space that they need if they need it. So this is just a short list of some of the potentially upsetting topics that we will be discussing in this presentation. Of course, if you have any need ever to take a step back or mute us or any of that, One, we won't know. And two, we won't take it personally. So please take care of yourselves. Next slide, please. 
Awesome. As we were saying earlier, the Transformations Project is a trans-led, volunteer-driven, <sighs> grassroots 501c nonprofit, 501c4 nonprofit. Notably, a 501c4 is quite different from a traditional nonprofit, which is a 501c3. The, the major important distinctions are that one, we as a C4 are released from the requirement to be nonpartisan. I'm not even going to go into how the requirement to be nonpartisan has <laughs> damaged movements in the United States, but we are free from that. And the drawback of our tax status is that unfortunately any financial support given to us is not tax deductible. That is important because at the end, as always, we uh, being entirely volunteer, entirely grassroots, no one is getting paid. Would really appreciate if you are able to toss us a couple bucks to keep our databases up and running. But and more importantly, more critically, because the work is more important than the money, and that is why nobody gets paid, and that's why we're here, is that the Transformations Project is dedicated to providing accurate, actionable, and accessible information about the anti-trans legislative crisis in the United States. That is our mission statement. And below that is our vision statement, which I would argue is more important. Our vision statement is we envision a world where through community, all trans people are empowered in their lives, safe from persecution, and able to express themselves without fear. That is the goal. That's the dream. That's where we're aiming. And everything we do is to try to just drag us by our fingernails closer to that. And also, thank you. All. <laughs> thank you for saying nice things about the logo in, uh, in the comments. I really appreciate it. The logo is extremely dear to us. I love it so much. And uh, the Phoenix is extremely intentional. When Sam and I founded this organization back in 2021, we were founding this organization to prepare for what we knew was coming, which is today and also in the future. And so our... You know, our, our imagery is very important to that. And it always has been and always will be. We will rise from the ashes regardless. Because one of the things, okay, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but this is relevant at this moment. One of the things that gives me a lot of hope is that uh, trans people have always been here. Trans people have been born in every society that has ever existed. Because trans people are a natural and beautiful aspect of human diversity and experience. And what that fundamentally means is that we are going to win in the very long run. No matter what we suffer now, no matter what atrocities are going on, there will always be more trans people. And our job as trans people who are breathing and alive today is to try to clear their way so they can have a gentler time on this earth than us. And so that really is kind of my, uh, my guiding light with that. And so when, you know, when the anti-trans lobby says they want to eliminate transgenderism, it's not possible. It can't happen. When we say we want trans people to be free and loving and alive, that is possible. Ah. All right, this is our introduction slide. We sort of already introduced ourselves earlier, so I think we could just sort of jump into your things so that we make sure that we have enough time since it's already 20 after. Um, does that sound good to you, Alex? Yeah, beautiful. Thank you for keeping me on track. No worries. All right, here we go. Ah. Cool. Yeah, so this slide is kind of just to address the elephant in the room, which is actually a really good pun, it just occurred to me. And uh, yeah. I just really feel it was important when we were making this presentation to emphasize that the work is important. The work is critical. The work is unending and the work will always be there. And my point with saying that is that the work will be there when you're ready. And that's not to say, don't try to be ready because we can't afford an action. But what I'm saying with that is processing this moment, processing the grief and the rage and the sadness that is with us all right now in this room is part of the work. Because if we don't give ourselves space to process that, 
we can't show up for each other in ways that are meaningful. And that is the work. So for anyone else who needs to hear it, this is permission. Permission to grieve and permission to be devastated and permission to be angry and permission to be sad and permission to feel all of the things that all of the people who have made it very clear they don't want us around in our complexity are constantly telling us is an overreaction. It's not an overreaction. You deserve to feel it and you deserve to give yourself space to feel it. And I can tell you, you aren't alone in that. And for me, at least, one of the best ways to grieve is to find others' grief. There's, uh, I've been reading a really, a lot of James Baldwin to cope over the last week, which has been, as always, a guiding light in dark times. And one quote that's very famous of him is um, he, he, oh my gosh, he wrote basically that um, you think your pain and heartbreak is unprecedented in the history of the world. And then you read. So that's what I've been doing. And for me, that reading and that writing has been connection. And so whatever is connection to you, make space for it right now. Next slide, please. Secondarily, I really, really want to emphasize that um, this isn't new. This is a continuation of everything that has come before. And for better or for worse, being human, being born on this earth, is being born to a legacy of grief that you will never understand. But that's where we are. And that's the work, is to pick up what we were left and make it better before we leave. And in this time, I really encourage everyone to understand very intimately that there is no amount of acceptability that will save you. And the politics of trying to say, oh, but I'm one of the good ones, or you know, I'm not like that, or basically anything that is appealing to the people who want you dead for the hopes of getting out yourself. Not only is it detrimental to the movement and to everyone else who shares your identity, it also won't work. And so I really do encourage us all to look deep inside ourselves and recognize very clearly whether you recognized it before or whether you recognize it now, that's, we all arrive at the time we're meant to arrive. But once we have that information, what we really need to do with it is be radically, radically honest and radically kind to each other. And the only way on this earth to be radically kind is to be radically authentic, truly. And I love this quote, and I've been seeing it everywhere now. And every time I see it, it makes me smile because this isn't new. And we will continue. And if you take anything from this monologue at the beginning of this presentation, I want it to be two things. Firstly, your grief is valid and you deserve to feel it. And secondly, we've been here before. Um, and for me at least, and I would really encourage this for other folks who are less marginalized, especially other white folks in queer spaces, is to recognize and really grapple with the, the fact that our whiteness has protected us from so much. 
And fundamentally, that makes us less prepared. And so now, I mean always, but there's no time like the present to recognize that the community leaders in our spaces, especially those who are subject to racism, especially those who are black or indigenous, they've been surviving this for generations upon generations. And we're new to the party, right? We just showed up. So we have a lot to learn and that's okay. It's okay to have a lot to learn, but we have to be listening to learn it. Thank you. Now we'll get into it. Next slide, please. All right. So we're gonna give a little bit of background here about some of the different types of intersections we've been seeing when it comes to bodily autonomy, the fight for bodily autonomy and how they overlap with trans rights. And one of the things I wanted to start with as a little bit of a sort of primer is the Miffy case. If, for those of you who are not familiar with what the Miffy case is or what Miffy Perstone is as a general thing, Miffy Perstone, sometimes called the abortion pill, is, is a pill that's been they use, using, used in conjunction with another pill called misoprost. I'm gonna not try to pronounce that, to abort a pregnancy. It's incredibly successful. It's incredibly safe. It was developed back in the 1980s. It's been in use in, in France since 87 and has had a longstanding approval from the FDA for use within, for, for use, for commercial use since 2000. It is very, very safe. It has a 97% success rate within the first nine weeks. It is a standard, standard part of medicine as it stands within the modern world. And of course, in April, 2023, a Trump appointed federal judge in Texas ruled to suspend the FDA's approval. Now, the way that this works with federal judges essentially is that this would have theoretically taken effect across the entire country. So one judge, in Texas could have stopped the entire country from using this pill that has been used for decades and is incredibly safe and incredibly well understood, arguing that safety had not been taken into account at the time. Now, in truth, when you look at the political maneuvering underneath the hood, a lot of this was actually about the fact that it actually got approved during the pandemic for being used as a type of mailing, like they could mail people their medication. And they approved that mifepristone could be one of those medications you could mail because again it is so profoundly safe and this ensued an entire giant legal battle and i can tell you because i was in various calls and seeing all these things and following these things is that there's just months and months and months of battles back and forth back and forth it eventually got settled by the supreme court surprisingly in mifepristone's favor which was very odd but the one thing i want you to take away from this the thing that's really important to understand is this idea of safety being used to strip away established medical care and safe medical care, as well as to undermine precedent. This argument of safety, of, of protection, of specifically, there was lots of fear-mongering about fertility, because again, it's an abortion drug, so it has some minor side effects. You know, it, it may make you, you know, bleed a little, make you feel a little uncomfortable, but it is incredibly, but there are no long-term consequences, uh, you know, assuming regular usage and all that kind of stuff. But they use these arguments of safety. That's what I want you to remember, priming you here, that the arguments of safety being used specifically within an, an abortion pill, this rhetoric is one of the most underlying, under is, is the primary underpinning that it builds the connection between issues of bodily autonomy as the general public understands them, which is typically within the realm of contraception, abortion, things like that, and how that applies to trans right issues, right? These things are very connected. So here's a bit of a more explicit thing. Now, not only are these things attacked, one thing to understand, these rights are being attacked by the same general forces. If you've heard of the Heritage Foundation, the authors of Project 2025, as well as places like the ADF and many other organizers, people, everybody who you see as, trust me, as somebody who tracks this legislation every day, the same people who are running, who are, who are sponsoring, who are pushing for anti-trans legislation and the people who are sponsoring anti-abortion rules or anti-contraceptive things or any sort of restrictions in therein, they are literally the exact same people. It's not that there's two different, very similar groups that are allied. It is the same people oftentimes in the same breath. And interestingly, they have started to argue that these issues are legally speaking, not distinct. 
A really good example of this would be last year, there was a gender affirming care ban that passed in Nebraska. It was all, there was, there was a whole story here. Gender affirming care ban was filibustered for weeks on end, thanks to some truly heroic work by um, representatives Kavanaugh and Hunt, but it eventually ended up getting pushed through with a whole bunch of not so incredibly, uh, somewhat shady uh, legislative practices, but I won't get into that. When it got passed through, it also had onto it stapled a 12 week abortion ban. The way it was worded meant that it actually was sort of more practically a 10 week abortion ban, but it, 12 weeks was technically the, the term set. These two bills were initially two entirely separate bills, neither of which were actually able to pass thanks to the various filibustering and, and some heroic efforts. However, they were then combined and pushed through. Now, Important context, Nebraska as a state is really unique in their legislation for a whole bunch of reasons, but one of the things they have is they have something called the single subject rule. The single subject rule basically says that if you have a bill, you can only add things to that bill that are actually relevant to what the bill was always primarily about. So you can't, for example, and I'm totally not thinking of several bills that I've seen over the years and picking out of a hat, you can't say have a bill that's 300 pages of automotive legislation and then tack on to the middle of it. Oh yeah, by the way, non-binary people can't have an X on the driver's license. Yes. I've read, read several bills that basically had that equivalent, where they had hundreds of pages of bills, hundreds of pages of legislation that had nothing to do with, with trans people. And then they had a random part that just attacked random bits, of, attacked trans people essentially because they could. They would sort of put these riders in. And because the bill itself, the initial bill is so important, the riders got pushed along here too. It's a very common tactic. You see it all the time, especially on the national level. And Nebraska has the single subject rule specifically to avoid such things. And to show you how strict these, these rulings were previously, in 2020, there was a ballot measure that got rejected from being allowed to, uh, a ballot measure that was rejected basically because it, it was a ballot measure about the legalization of marijuana. And it, in within the ballot measure would have had both the legalizing marijuana itself, as well as legalizing the production of marijuana. And that was ruled by the courts to be not, to not apply, to not, to not be following the single subject rules. So they were very strict previously about whether or not what is allowed on a, a piece of legislation so that it follows this rule, whether or not it's germane is the term. And yet this bill got pushed through. Not only did it get pushed through, but the, the Nebraska Supreme Court held it and it is currently law. There was a whole bunch of fights about this and they basically just said, oh, they're both healthcare, so it's fine. So here's what I want you to take away from this, aside from the fact that, you know, conservatives are frequently hypocrites and break their own rules for the purposes of political gain. This is not new. If our opponents are not, are, are, are claiming that these are the same issue, and in fact, our opponents are saying quite loudly that these are the same issue. There are various hearings. We'll be like, yes, of course, this is germane. They are the same subject. They are the same fight. Then it's important for us to understand that they are also the same fight for us. When it comes to these things, the right to our bodies Legally speaking, especially, there is no distinction fundamentally between what is having the right to gender affirming care versus the right to an abortion. Yeah. Here you go. I would actually even argue that an abortion can be and is often gender affirming care, but that's a whole separate point. Okay. So one of the things that I have spent a lot of time writing and speaking about is transmasculine people as people who need and receive reproductive health care. And one of the things that I really encourage us as advocates within trans spaces to consider is to consider just discussing that issue more frequently and highlighting that, especially as, especially as we move into the future where these issues are intertwined inextricably. They always have been, but it will become even more critical. And strategically, one of the things that we have seen in the country, in the United States, is that the right to abortion and the right to access meaningful reproductive care is very popular, even in extremely conservative regions. I am coming to you right now from the state of Missouri, which yes, Sam and I both live in St. Louis, Missouri. And we, uh, the state of Missouri voted overwhelmingly red, voted overwhelmingly Republican in this election. However, a ballot initiative that was on, that was on the ballot as well was to overturn 
the abortion ban that had been placed in Missouri. And the ballot measure to overturn the abortion ban passed. There's going to be some nonsense in the courts going on about whether or not the will of the people as represented on a ballot initiative will be respected. However, that is educational. And that is important to us to notice and think about strategically because reproductive justice is a popular position among many, many people, including Republican voters. And that matters because fundamentally, if we can get more people to understand that reproductive justice and trans justice are the same issue and are fundamentally about reproductive autonomy and bodily autonomy, we have a foot in the door and we can counter some of the horrific anti-trans messaging that is overwhelming right now. Uh, I have a bunch of different points on this slide and I'm gonna go through them from the top to the bottom. Oh, I did, the, I did all that already. Many people are unaware that trans masculine people accessing reproductive health care is an ordeal to say the least. I can speak from my personal experience and say that in my quest to get a gender affirming hysterectomy, I was denied over seven times. I had to move states and it took over three years. And I am one of the very fortunate ones. The barriers placed for trans masculine people to access reproductive health care, let alone reproductive justice, are horrific and often insurmountable and not talked about nearly enough, including within trans advocacy. And I have a couple points here about some of the major issues, but I would really encourage you if you are interested in some of these subjects to spend some time looking into them. Inaccessibility of reproductive health care due to discrimination or violence. Trans masculine people overwhelmingly report discrimination from medical providers and that discrimination is higher in reproductive settings. Trans people in general absolutely report overwhelming discrimination from medical providers. Another thing that many people are unaware of is that many trans masculine people, especially trans masculine people who present masculine and are perceived as masculine, face unique barriers in accessing reproductive health care. It is, I have in my personal experience, I have never been to a, you know, women's health facility without being openly stared at, if not mocked and insulted. And I am, again, one of the very fortunate ones. There are plenty of people who have been faced with actual violence for being a man in a woman's space. And that's critical to understand that that argument applies to transmasculine people trying to access reproductive health care in many cases. Misinformation, rampant. Go on to any transmasculine community space and you will find dozens of transmasculine people whose doctors told them that testosterone is birth control. It is not. It is not. And if I, testosterone is not birth control, please. Use birth control if you do not want to be pregnant. <sighs> Lack of knowledge about transmasculine patients by providers, rampant, horrific. I have yet to be to a reproductive health appointment where the doctor did not explicitly say something along the lines of, wow, I've never had a patient like you, or I don't know what to do for you as a patient. I have had a doctor openly say to me, it is not important to me to learn about you because there aren't enough of you for it to count. And we need to keep in mind that the stakes for reproductive health care are incredibly high. Incredibly, incredibly high. Pregnancy is an extremely difficult and challenging circumstance for cis women, let alone for someone who may have dysphoria around pregnancy let alone for someone for whom additional barriers are placed to accessing things like birth control or accessing things like prenatal care or even being treated respectfully when actually giving birth. There are transmasculine people out there, many of them, 
who choose to carry pregnancies and they absolutely deserve the right to do that. And the reactions to them existing as pregnant masculine people are horrific, including from doctors. The horrifying terror stories of violation by doctors, whether by negligence or by actual assault during births, are horrific for cis women, let alone trans masculine people. All of this also must be considered in the context that trans masculine people are very often subject to corrective rape, by which it is argued that a cis man raping a trans masculine person will put them in their place or make them understand they're a girl or a woman. That is a, it, it's an atrocity and it's a common one. Um, and that can lead to pregnancy in many cases. Pregnancy related violence is horrific. When you consider the statistic, and this is a true statistic, the number one cause of death for pregnant people, for pregnant cis women in the United States is murder. That is true, objectively. And when you consider how that may be disproportionately applied to trans masculine people, you start to see the problem. And we don't even have data on that, by the way, because no one's studying it effectively. Domestic violence and abuse rampant towards trans masculine people. And again, can result in pregnancy in many cases. And then again, rejection from resources designated for women to help with these issues. It is a common, common narrative that trans masculine people trying to escape domestic violence are turned away from domestic violence sheltered shelters because they are too masculine or they are a man and woman's spaces. Yeah. My argument with all of this is to say that we need to think critically as activists, as organizers, as trans people, as a society about what we designate as a woman's space because Reproductive care for people with uterine systems is not a woman's space. It's a space for people with uterine systems who are not all women. And that difference is life and death. In most cases, and I, I will say this with my whole chest, in the majority of cases, by far, trans masculine people have a choice. And it's an impossible choice. Because the choice is you misgender yourself and walk into the women's healthcare clinic to get care where you will very likely be abused and discriminated against, or you go without care. And both of those are ridiculously damaging, if not life-threatening. Thank you. One thing before we move on to the next slide, I want to emphasize this, and I want to emphasize this specifically as a trans femme person, is that, I don't know about you, but a lot of the things that Alex just said are things that I have heard a thousand times from other trans women specifically being told that they can't go to, for example, domestic violence shelters without being told that they're, you know, a man in women's spaces. The important thing to understand here because it's really because one of the problems with, with trans mask existence so frequently is that they are erased from the conversation, right? For all that trans women like myself are frequently the whipping girl, we are we are the target of a lot of the violence and hate or the, the public one. Trans masks are subject as well to those same arguments and to those same sorts of violence. They are simply it is done so in a sort of shameful, quiet, don't talk about it, we're just gonna bury you under the covers kind of co cover cover under the underneath the ground kind of way, right? So the important emphasis that I think we all need to always understand is that trans people are always going to be perceived by those who are oppressing us as whatever gender is most convenient for them at, this, at the given moment. And that can change and will change with every breath that they take. They will accuse you of being a man when it is convenient and then accuse you in the next sentence, maybe even the same sentence of being a woman so that they could, you know, whatever gets them the most power, whatever gets them the highest position. So the thing you need to understand here is the idea that we are all dealing with the same shit here, right? It is all 
like it'll, it will affect everybody uniquely. And for example, trans masks and the intersection between trans mask existence and trans mask oppression and the fact that they have uteruses and all of the places where you can get care for that organ are called women's spaces and will treat you like that and are very much designed for that. You need to understand that it, it although there's those unique aspects of how everything will intersect with your personal existence in, in all those very important and complicated ways, fundamentally, again, we are whatever is most convenient for our oppressors in their eyes. So solidarity is really the only way we're going to get anywhere, right? That is the fundamental truth. Okay. All right. Thank you, Sam, for saying that. I really appreciate it. And I will actually underline that not only will trans people universally be treated as whatever gender is convenient to the oppressor, we will also simultaneously be ostracized from that gender category. So we will be treated as women, regardless of our actual, when it is convenient to label us as weak. And we will be treated as men, regardless of our presentation or gender, when it is convenient to label us as dangerous. And we will be treated as neither always so that we can be treated as another. So whenever you're finding like contradictions in, in, in transphobic arguments and transphobic abuse that you probably will see online, for example, understand that the contradictions are not, and you're not really catching them out on anything. It's core to how it works. It's core to how the trans transphobia works. It is inherently hypocritical. It is inherently contradictory. And so, you know, you need to remember that because otherwise you don't have a un good understanding of Yeah, contradiction is a feature, not a bug. Thank you, Allison, in the chat. All right, now, in the interest of time, let's keep going. So we've all heard of Project 2025, right? There are a lot of uh, terrible things in that that we have all been terrified about for the last, I don't know how long, at least a year or more. It is also 900 pages long. It is a policy handbook for those who are somehow unaware, written by the Heritage Foundation, includes a whole bunch of different things, including a 180, the first 180 days in office plan for every federal agency. And it has a significant overlap with Trump's proposed agenda, Agenda 47. It's, they're basically very much similar. They have essentially, they're essentially- Do you want to know how connected they are? Vance wrote the foreword for the book that the guy who wrote Project 2025 is publishing. Yeah. Um, and they coordinated to delay the publication of that book until after the election. So that's where yes, we're at. Of course. So given the results as such as they are, fears for what will happen are high, and that is incredibly understandable. It is terrifying. Um, and, but of course, it is 900 pages, and nobody has the time to read all that kind of stuff. So we're going to go over a little bit of stuff here, but I also want to very importantly, this is the big part here. I want to point you to the report by the National Women's Law Center. National Women's Law Center is a wonderful organization. I mean, like all organizations, there are people who are less than ideal and it is an organization. So, you know, there are C3 that gives them certain restrictions, but they are genuinely a wonderful organization. And they are a bunch of people who are genuinely very understanding of trans existence and also who are also very much, I, I know some people within the organization who have always had the most wonderful assistance and they've always been very, very, forthright and understanding and willing to learn about trans experiences that is in a way that is incredibly heartening. They put out a report a while back, September, about Project 2025, how it affects women's families and gender justice and basically reproductive health as a whole. And it is an excellent read. I would highly suggest it. If you want to have a bit of a more detailed understanding of what exactly may be coming down the pipe without necessarily having to read the genuinely horrifying rhetoric that is 900 pages of policy written by the Heritage Foundation. As somebody who's written, has read hundreds of pages of stuff written by the Heritage Foundation, aka almost all anti-trans legislation, I don't re recommend it. Read it if you have a reason to. Try not to if you don't have to. So here are a couple things that we will likely be seeing. Alex, you had a thing? Mm, sorry, I just wanted to add one real quick thing to this list that is absolutely critical for everyone, like every person in this country. Project 2025 explicitly calls to ban no-fault divorce. And no-fault divorce is a policy change in the institution of marriage that allows people to get a legal divorce because they choose to. Before no-fault divorce, there you would have to go before a court and argue for a specific reason, a justifiable reason, to get a divorce. And if 
you think about it for 30 seconds, you will see some problems there. Continue, Sam. Yeah. All right. So here are some provisions specifically. I am cherry. I have cherry. This is, these are some of the ones I cherry picked specifically when it comes to the thing with, with, with specifically the topic of this presentation, but understand that there are many more that I could did, simply do not have the time to go through. So I'm just, again, I highly recommend read the report. It is going to be extremely helpful and informative. And also it means that when you rec when you see the headlines and you see what's happening in the next couple of years, you can recognize what it is. And knowledge is definitely power here. And this definitely applies in the situation. So broadly speaking, these there are provisions that are attacking protections against sex discrimination, including in housing, employment, housing, healthcare, and schooling. For those who are unaware, the only legal protections that trans people have that have been incredibly shaky, they are based on sex discrimination rulings in, in, as their legal sort of foundation. Basically, if it would be, if you are discriminating against somebody because you think that they are a man and they are wearing a dress, that is sex discrimination because regardless of what that person identifies as, because again, everybody has the right to wear a dress. That's essentially the foundational argument for how trans people kind of jury rigged ourselves into having legal rights in this country. And that argument is under attack all over the country, but specifically Project 2025 very much outlines wanting to remove these sorts of things. And they also would apply not just for sex discrimination, they also want to remove general types of discrimi discrimination protections, things like greed, religion, etc., making it a lot easier to be incredibly racist to somebody without necessarily getting caught. They also want to remove terms like abortion and sexual reproductive rights from federal regulations. Basically, if you just, this is a very common tactic within these, within these circles, that is if you remove the term that people use to describe themselves or remove important terms like this from the law, it means it is a lot easier for the law to, basically it means that the law is much less effect, effective at protecting people because you don't just actually call out what it is the law is supposed to be addressing directly. There will be mass, there will be attempts to have massive amounts of surveilling of pregnancies. We've seen this in states like Texas and other places like that, where people who are pregnant are going to be like watched and not allowed to cross state borders to, in order to access care, even in the case of emergency, even in the case of life-threatening emergency, where, for example, the fetus is dead and the mother or, the, or the, simply the parent is trying to not die. Yes, we're seeing this. We also, one of the big aspects of Project 2025 that will impact a whole lot of people is conflating Plan B, the morning after pill, with abortive care. They are different things. Plan B doesn't work by aborting a, a, a pregnancy. Rather, it, it's a contraceptive, right? It prevents the pregnancy from happening in the first place, necessarily. It's, I am simplifying, but we have time that I want to make sure. Yes, Alex. Notably, notably about conflating Plan B and abortive care is that that actually goes against their own logic, which is that, well, their stated logic anyway, their stated logic is that, you know, life begins at conception. Plan B prevents conception because unlike the imagination of 99% of people on earth, conception actually happens a few days after, after sex or insemination. And so plan B prevents, prevents fertilization of an egg. It does not abort anything, even by their own standards. And I will also add to this list that I see here that not only is no fault divorce on the chopping block, for, but for all the uh, log cabin Republicans out there, it, Project 25 explicitly design, uh, defines marriage as between one man and one woman and says that it is a biblically derived and social science supported definition of marriage. So that's also in there. We also see other bits. These are, again, we're just going through the most relevant in this immediate moment. We see they want to gut Medicaid and cut basically all federal funding that would theoretically maybe kind of sort of go towards, yeah, social science supported. Service. Yeah, which is, uh, by the way, when they say social science supported, that is the dog whistle for eugenics, like whole. That means that they are coming to for interracial marriages as defined by them, of course, and also coming for the very few rights disabled people have in this country around marriage. And yeah, it's, we're all in this together, folks. 
Yeah. Cutting Medicaid and federal funding for abortion and gender affirming care. Many of the gender affirming care bans that we have seen so far, they initially will apply only to those under the age of 18, which is still horrifying. However, they almost all of them will also have provisions saying that, oh, by the way, we're also going to ban any federal, any public funds from being allowed to be used for any sort of theory, even in theory, for gender affirming care. Now, if you remove the ability for state funds to be used for gender affirming care, you remove the ability for federal funds to be used for gender affirming care. If you know anything about the way that healthcare, the healthcare system works, you know that state and federal funds have their hands in literally every single medical facility in this country, even the private ones, in truth except for like the most exclusive ones. So it's basically trying to make a, a, a ban against gender affirming care as well as abortion procedures for everybody, no matter what. Yes, go ahead. And with the conscience clause, it's critical to realize and know that most hospital systems in the United States are faith-based. Right, so- Most of them. And so, especially when you're considering Catholic institutions, which are a huge proportion of, of hospital systems in the United States, the Pope has explicitly said that according to doctrine, and again, according to Catholics, the Pope is God speaking in the present. The Pope has explicitly said that gender affirming care is against Catholicism. So please keep that in mind, especially as it's going to become more and more legal to deny care. Do your research on your hospital. What Alex is talking about with the conscience thing there is the last point. You skipped ahead to a tiny oh, bit. Love. Allowing conscience is an excuse to die, deny care. This is a long established bit of stuff that we've seen kind of all over the country as well. Basically, the principle here is, is whenever you see deny it, if you think of the gay baking lawsuit from a while back or, or the, 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 it's the idea that basically my conscience says that I can't do this service for usually a gay gay people gay couple i'm not going to make a i'm not going to make a wedding cake for a gay wedding because i'm christian and that's against my beliefs essentially using your religion as a tool to then make it so that actually it's discrimination if you stop me from discriminating is basically the argument it's very sort of playground nonsense but it's been expanded even more and if you have unfortunately if you live in a place like florida you may be familiar with this that they have on the state level had lots of different rules that basically say that you can deny care for any reason or, or deny care based on conscience for any particular reason. Now, here's the thing. These are typically aimed at basically making it so that doctors and nurses don't have to treat queer and trans people. However, they also apply to anything because the way that these are worded are incredibly vague and broad. They basically say that if you have a conscience objection to the way that you're a patient who comes up in front of you lives their life, you do not have to treat them, which is pretty much explicitly against how like doctors are supposed to work. It's really quite horrifying. It doesn't necessarily apply. It doesn't, it does not mean to be clear. It's not the same thing as banning gender affirming, ma making it impossible for someone to give gender affirming care or to give care to a gender diverse person. Rather, it's about legalizing the ability for other people within the medical system to refuse to give access, refuse to do their jobs, their legally obligated jobs, because they disagree, disagree, because they are, because they are transphobic, because they are queerphobic, because they are homophobic, or for any other potential reason. This is absolutely something that is within Project 2025. They would like to expand this to not just be on a state level, but also to apply across the country and to be the law of the land, which means that you can't even necessarily trust your hospitals to literally treat you, let alone whether or not they'll saddle you with the bill. And again, this is where the fact that many of the hospitals within this country are faith-based institutions really comes into play because most faiths will have, well, you know, especially Christian faiths, Catholic, you know, major, major institutions like that will, you know, if the Pope says it is against Catholicism to have gender affirming care and everybody within a faith-based hospital are allowed to refuse care or are told that they're supposed to refuse care because they are in a Catholic hospital. Yeah, so much for do no harm. There you go. This is something that is something you, one, we, we will need to be concerned about and something that we are concerned about. So again, these are just some of the provisions. If you have the ability to, I highly recommend looking up the full, the full, uh, the full report. We will also put something in the chat in a moment, I believe, but for now, I think we're going to go move on to the next slide. And I believe that's yours, Alex, now. Yes. Yeah. One, one last little point about the Pope's statement, which is, is very relevant 
to all of this because a lot of the anti-trans organizing and the anti-abortion organizing is coming from a Catholic, a Catholic base and viewpoint. In the very same statement that the Pope uh, says that gender affirming care is against Catholic doctrine, he also says that abortion care is against Catholic doctrine. And the fact that those are intrinsically connected, even in the Pope's statement, ban or banning both of those for Catholics effectively is relevant because our, our opposition recognizes that these are the same issue. Great, next slide. Thank you, Sam. And now we're going to talk about, um, okay, so we've gone through some of this, but we've gone through a little of this, just for those who are unaware and many folks are unaware, unfortunately, there is a book out there. This book is called Irreversible Damage and it is by Abigail Schreier and the cover art really tells you what it's about. They're pretty upfront about it. This is a moral panic about specifically young transmasculine people not having babies. That is what it's about. And it's more specifically about white young transmasculine people not having babies. And Schreier makes that argument in her book very explicitly. I bring up this book because one, irreversible damage needs to be spoken about in trans communities and trans advocacy way more than it is because it is the blueprint for anti-trans masculinity. The amount of bills I've read specifically that use the term irreversible damage, basically directly quoting this bill, I literally could not count them for you. It would be hundreds. Our opposition knows about this book. Our opposition has read it cover to cover. We need to know what is in this because that is their playbook. Irreversible damage is one of the core tenets of anti-trans masculine theory. And when I say anti-trans masculine theory, what I mean is the intersection of transphobia and misogyny that is specifically directed at trans masculine people. Irreversible damage argues very explicitly that the problem with the transgender craze, as Schreier so kindly puts it, is that white trans masculine people won't have white babies, period. And if that reeks to you of great replacement theory, it's because it is, flat out. For those who do not know, great replacement theory is neo-Nazi stuff. It is white supremacy in its most blatant form. It is an argument made by many white supremacists that white folks are in danger of being outbred. And if that is uh, familiar to you as Nazi stuff or as eugenics, it's because it is. And also, this is a really, really poignant example of how anti-transness and misogyny are white supremacy. Inherently, when you dig deeper, it's always connected, every time. And once you understand the arguments put forward in irreversible damage, you start seeing them everywhere in anti-trans propaganda. Specifically, Schreier's argument here, which again has become a blueprint for anti-trans theorists and activists, activists and organizers and all of that all over the world, because this is an international movement and it is coordinated. And yes, that is proven, but I'm not gonna put myself in danger by giving you the source. Do some digging. Schreier argues that trans masculine people are traitors to womanhood and motherhood for not carrying pregnancies. For anybody with a keen eye or eyes at all, you might notice that um, saying that people with uteruses not having babies is morally wrong is misogyny, period. That's what it is. It's the same exact argument used to force cis women into horrifying relationships and abuse and being forced to carry pregnancies to term all over the world and through history for a very long time. And one of the things that I really want to point out too, I said it in the comments, but it's really critical, is that um, trans people are trans regardless of whether they're out. So whenever you're talking about any time, you are talking about women being abused in the past or in the present. You are also talking about transmasculine people. 
because they're there. They're there just as much as the cis women are. Irreversible damage is the blueprint for anti-trans masculinity and white supremacist great replacement narratives. And the fact that this has been ignored in widespread community organizing on trans issues is a tactical error, in my opinion. Because are, one, yeah, sorry. One, we're not mobilizing cis women to fight for us. Cis women are showing up for abortion rights. They should be showing up for all bodily autonomy if they understood that it's connected. And this is the key link. The key link is, hey, trans masculine people also exist. And trans masculine people are so invisibilized, so erased from so many narratives, including within the trans community, that this isn't even known. This isn't, this is very rarely discussed. And truly in my heart of hearts, I really believe that we cannot afford to ignore this connection. We cannot afford to ignore anti-trans masculinity as a concept and as a narrative and as a movement any longer. And I want to be really explicitly clear here for anybody who chooses to misinterpret me. I am not saying that trans misogyny is not real. I am not saying that trans misogyny is not important. And I'm not saying that trans misogyny is not devastating. I am saying anti-trans masculinity must also be considered because to be a trans movement, we must be a movement for all trans people and all issues that affect trans people. There are one thing to understand again, and I'm saying this as somebody who has read hundreds of pieces of anti-trans legislation. There are two primary arguments that are used within these sorts of bills. Frequently at the same time, sometimes one, sometimes the other. They are this irreversible damage. They are the argument about, oh, what about the poor wounds? Or it is, oh God, the scary men want to attack our women by pretending to be women. I know we're all familiar with that one because that's one of the ones that gets a lot more publication. Those are the two pillars upon which they have built this hellscape. And to pretend otherwise is... Again, a tactical error, like Alex said, very much. And both of those pillars are applied to all trans people, as we said before. They're applied differently, for sure. But they, but they are, are applied. applied. They're applied to all trans people. Yeah. And really, um, it's fascinating to watch as a trans masculine person who now is perceived as a cis man and now has had a hysterectomy because it flips almost immediately. When I had a uterus and when I was perceived as feminine, all of the arguments against me, and I have been very publicly trans and writing about these issues for years now, all the arguments against me were protect this poor, helpless white girl from herself and from her own decisions, which you may recognize as an undermining of bodily autonomy and also misogyny. As soon as I was presenting and being perceived as a cis man, the argument turned immediately to do not let this man around children because he will indoctrinate them into being trans. And that tells you everything. And it's not a mistake. It's not an aberration. It is an accurate reflection of how these things work. So, And critically, every accusation is a confession. Yep. yep. All right. So here's, here's the fundamental truth when it comes to the intersections of, of, of bodily autonomy and healthcare access and things like abortion access and reproductive care and how they intersect with, with trans rights and trans access to gender affirming care. All healthcare has a risk. That is just how it works. All healthcare has a risk. The core truth about healthcare is that the difference between poison and medication is dosage. You know, Tylenol can cause liver failure that kills 29% of people who suffer from it. If you take much more than like, depending on the strength of the capsule, like the extra strength capsule, if you take like, I don't know, a dozen or, or two dozen, as opposed to just taking like six in one day, you are genuinely putting yourself at risk for liver failure. But that is why you take your doctors, you, you have, we have professionals like doctors, like nurses, like pharmacists, for a reason, because these things are complicated. The point how medication works is you minimize the downsides and you have the upsides and you emphasize those, right? All healthcare has a risk. 
to claim, as these people so frequently do and so constantly do and will continue to, that HRT or reproductive care should be stopped due to risk when the same arguments are not made against other types of medication shows that your actual objection is not with the risk. It is to, with the access to the medication itself. So don't let them hide behind it. All medication has a risk and to argue otherwise is silly. The point is, and this is, don't ever get, if it, someone says, oh, but healthcare isn't, isn't HRT risky. Oh, if gender affirming care is, isn't that risky or, 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 oh, isn't abortion risky? It's scary. All healthcare has, is, has risk to it. That's just how that health, how healthcare works. If, why are you so concerned about this and not any other number of things? And that really tells you all you need to know. So yeah, that's, that's the core point. That is the core fundamental reason and the core fundamental connection between these two, these two topics that are in fact one topic. So that's the end of the presentation as it, as it exists. We have a little bit of end slides here. We'll have, we have some Q&A time just a little bit. Apologies, we get a little bit fired up as you may have noticed. But please share our resources, the little, little blurb here. IP, again, we are a nonprofit that does not get access to most of the sort of funding. We are all funded by individual donations. So please share our work, share our resources. They are there, they are there for a reason. I, I, as well as many other people have worked very, very hard and they will be incredibly necessary, especially in the years to come. Thank you very much. Here's our socials. Here's a, here's a QR code. And I think I'm gonna then hand it over back to Rye. We can do our question and answers. One sec. Yes, yeah. um, critically, critically, one thing in the comments, people are talking about informed consent and how a lot of these attacks are talking about or making the argument that trans people are incapable of making those decisions for themselves. That's hugely to do with ableism. And if you are not learning from the disability rights movement about how to counter these kind of narratives, we need to be. Because regardless, any trans people are disabled. I am one of them. But additionally... Same. Additionally, to many of our opposition, transness is perceived as a disability. And that matters, whether it's true or not. That matters because that is how they are approaching it. And we need to understand the opposition. Secondarily, um, is there any way we could leave that last slide up with all our socials and everything in our QR while we have the, uh, while we have the Q&A? The, the QR code that was there links to our donation page. As Sam said, we are a grassroots effort. We are almost entirely funded by individual donations and truly our budget is minuscule compared to the a lot of bigger nonprofits. If you want to support grassroots organizing, we would really appreciate it. And if you have the ability, a monthly donation of even like a dollar supports us more going into the future. So thank you. And thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for engaging. All of your questions and comments were just so important. I am really just very grateful for your presence here. I answered a couple of the Q&As in the chat. Yes, I see that. Cool. And uh, yeah, if anybody would like our email, we can connect. I'm not sure how best to facilitate that. Rai, that might be a question for you. Sorry, now I will turn it over to Rai. Thank you. Yeah, I can make sure to have the, if you'd like me to put in the email for the resources, I can definitely do that. Just like send me what email you'd like me to put in for that. Sure. How about instead of handing out our email, how about we point people to, if you go to our website, which is transformationsproject.org, note that transformations is plural, transformationsproject.org. There is a, a box where you can make a submission uh, to you know request resources or anything. If you just put in that box and say, hey, I attended the Plume presentation and would like to connect with Alex or Sam or both, our, our folks will get you in contact with us. So that's probably the best way to do it. Thank you. Wait, let me go ahead and put that in the chest, right? Now. Um, yeah. Do you want me to find that link? Yeah, I got it. Okay, thank you, Rath. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much, you two, Sam and Alex. Amazing information, as always. So insightful. And also, yeah, there's no blame. There's nothing wrong with getting fired up about this. <laughs> Truly. But this is really important work. And I think, like, the information is really valuable and so needed and so important to see like the intersections of all of the all of this you know like it, it's so important to see the intersections because it is so intertwined you know i i see that you did answer the two questions that came in into the q a but i'm curious if you'd like to you know some people don't see the q a answers would you be down to kind of like 
verbalize the question and like the answer that you had written up? Yeah, yeah, Sam, I hope it's okay that I just took those while you were chatting. Yeah. So someone um, asked, someone asked a question, we Medicaid gutting abortion and gender affirming care. Question, what about a state that has this codified in our laws? So there's been a lot of talk in community and in organizing spaces in particular about safe states that have safe state laws. And that's a really complicated subject. The short answer that I gave is that every state that um, every state that has a safe state law for trans people or for abortion access or for both is different. And all of the laws are different. And also all of those laws are built on different existing state law. More complicated is the fact that none of these laws have been tested in court. And with a court system that is increasingly and increasingly and going to be increasingly hardline conservative because it is being packed by a very conservative administration, Again, they may be overturned. And so I will say you are safer in a state with a safe state law, uh, but it would be a fundamental mistake, in my opinion, to trust that you are safe, period, in that state, because that may not be the case. And we don't know. We don't have that answer. And also, yeah. I am not a lawyer. So what I can say about legal proceedings in a, case of, a court of law is limited by that as well. But, you know, stay vigilant, stay cautious. And above all, the law is a piece of paper. That's all it is. I, um, I was and say. while the law is a very big tool to protect people, you can hold up the law in front of you as much as you want. But if somebody's coming at you, they don't care necessarily. So please be vigilant, be alert, and also recognize that not only can the law be changed, by the powers that enforce the law and create the laws at pretty much most times, but also that the enforcement of the law matters and how laws are enforced in this country has been overwhelmingly anti-trans. Anti-trans abuse by uh, police officers is rampant already, and we see no evidence that that will change other than getting worse. One thing that I, I want to say to sort of also clarify a little bit, even if the states even if a court does necessarily overturn some of these laws, the big thing you need to understand is that you're going to have a lot of, like the Miffy Pristone case. What happened there, there was a, a, a Texas judge that said that, oh, we can't use Miffy Pristone across the country because federal court. And literally two hours later, a court in Washington said the opposite. They were both federal judges. It was basically a matter of who blinked first. There's going to be a lot of that when it comes to these sorts of protection laws not only because of exactly their specific wording, but also because of lawsuits and because of how this works. So if you are in a safer state, if you are integrated into that community, that makes you safer as well, because it means that you have your neighbors there to help you prote help protect you against any potential out-of-state or federal persecution. Yeah, you, really having not. your local community is how, is when the, your neighbors back you up, I cannot emphasize how much that helps. Yeah, 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 really truly emphasize that. I want to quickly address the two last questions in the chat, and then I want to have some love and hope before we go, as Dandy so lovely requested. Second, second question that I had in the Q&A is, what about separation of state and church? Separation of state and church is a slogan. It's not really reality in the United States, and it kind of never has been. To understand that more is that the Constitution and the United States government was established and designed in the 1780s, which means that for the time it was ra it was a radical separation of church and state. But the comparison is monarchs, like whole kings that said, God picked me to be king, so I'm in charge. So compared to that, yeah, there's a separation of church and state. But in the modern context, not really. In the modern context, the United States government and all of its derivations are heavily influenced by uh, a lot of theology, particularly different variations of Christian theology, particularly different variations of Protestant Christian theology, and particularly in the modern movement and the modern movement by uh, Christian evangelicals. That is a whole movement currently. And the very last question that is a great opportunity to chat 
is that someone asked, what can I do to help local Tennessee as well as national? And I am going to say, please go to transformationsproject.org because at transformationsproject.org, we have every anti-trans bill that has been established in every state, not established, sorry, bill, not a law, every anti-trans bill that has been proposed in every state since 2021. And you can read all of those with plain language descriptions of what they would actually do for actual people, not for legal interpreters. Additionally, we have rep records on where representatives have voted on anti-trans legislation and sponsored for the last several years since 2021. And we have all voting, we have all contact information for all reps at the state and national level in the country. So please start there do your education, learn what your local rep has supported, learn what bills are going on in your state, and then connect with local groups doing the work. Our philosophy at Transformations Project fundamentally is that community saves us. We are doing interpretation for communities all over the country, right? We are the interpreters because you know what your community needs far better than I could ever know. And that leads us really nicely into my last thoughts, which are that community has always saved us. Community has always been and is and always will be all we have, you know? And that's really why I was talking so much about learning from community elders, and particularly community elders who have faced discrimination generationally. Because one of the strange things about being queer is that you aren't born into discrimination necessarily. You come out into it. And that makes us somewhat unprepared compared to many people whose ancestors have taught them how to survive, right? We don't necessarily come with that built in in our family, which is part of why found family is such a huge deal in queer community, because that generational knowledge must be passed on, it must be to survive. And, you know, we as young queer people in the US are at a very fundamental disadvantage in certain ways because we are in the aftermath of the AIDS crisis, which in the United States literally wiped out a huge proportion of our community and just left a generational, generational gap for many people. And also we are some of the youngest people, some of the youngest queer people in the days of the internet. And that's huge because queer community moved onto the internet where before it was in physical space. And that has separated us generationally from older queer folks. And so if there's one thing that you can do to build community, truly I recommend you go find some elder queers not elder queers like five years older than you, elder queers like 20 years older than you, elder queers who have seen shit, elder queers who got through the AIDS crisis and know what heartbreak is and know what devastation is and know what it is like to be persecuted systematically. And also, again, like I said before, queers of color already know this. Learn from them too. And that's how we make it. That's how we survive. And that's how we've always survived. And so I am drawing a lot of strength right now from that concept that we are, you know, that there's this, very, this little slogan that I really do like, which is, this is not a moment, it's a movement. And once you understand that, once you place yourself in context, in, in time context, you realize I'm not doing this for me because I will never see trans liberation. I'm going to rot and die and trans liberation will not be here but someone will be closer to trans liberation because of me. So help me. And that's what I'm doing here. That's why I'm here. That's why this presentation happened. That's why this organization exists. Go out and do your part of it. And the other, the terrible, terrible, but beautiful thing about all discrimination and all bigotry being connected inherently It's really easy to see the underpinnings of all of it and see how interconnected it is and feel so small. But at the same time, if it's all connected, all you have to do is start pulling at one thread and it starts unraveling the whole thing. And if all of us come together 
to pull threads in our own ways with the skills that we have, we're going to bring this whole damn thing down. Truly love to all of you. I'm so grateful to be here with you. Please reach out if you would like to chat and I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Shit's about to get real, but we're about to get even realer. That's what we do. Thank you all. Thanks, Alex. Sam, any words? <laughs> I can't follow that up. Are you kidding? I mean, like, I also agree with that. I agree with all of that. It's yeah. Alex put it, I think, about as good as it can be. But yeah, no, you. Yeah. we are yeah. only... We are only, you know, the way we will survive is with through your community and people will astonish you if you just give them the chance to, to show you that they love you. It will also, you will also frequently be, you know, surprised or, you know, you will, people are also hateful and they will show that to you as well, but don't let the hateful people speak over, you know, overcrowd and shout over the ones who do love you and and understand that love can come in many different forms and be accepting of that. And I think yeah. we will do this. We if, will. If, if there's, I, I don't know, like we are, we're out of time, or at least I'm out of patience for performative love. I, uh, I wrote recently in one of the things I was writing that I, am, I don't have time to entertain any longer, only to educate. And the people who show up and the people who are listening, those are the people you keep talking to. And that's how we get it done. It's coming together over and over and over, no matter how many times they try to keep us apart and educating, really. It's all out there. There's nothing new in this world because there are billions of people and there were billions of people before us. And that isn't sad, that's beautiful. That means we are intimately and inextricably connected by our humanity. And all we have to do is remind people of that. One at a time. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you all. As always, beautiful speech, heartwarming and everything. Yeah, I can close this out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, literally, if you let me sit here, I would just like, I would just rant like, for so long. I have, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Okay, actually, there's one more thing. Over. We, we do I know, I know, I know. Out. This will take less than two minutes. I, this is the number one thing. If you look up one thing, well, you should look up a lot of things. But if you want to look up one thing, I am a geek about archaeology and anthropology. And there's a very famous quote from the anthropologist Margaret Mead where a student asked her, what is the first sign of civilization? And first of all, civilization is a bad word to use, but that's, that's old, that's old news. But what she said is important because what she said is a healed femur. And a femur is the very long bone that goes from your hip to your knee. In animals that don't take care of each other, a femur means death. We have evidence of healed femurs from before humans were a species. One of my favorite stories that we still have access to, which is a miracle on its own, is the story of Shanadar, which is a Neanderthal. Shanadar was a Neanderthal. He had severe wounds. He had an amputated arm. He had crush damage to his skull that probably left him blind and unable to hear. He was missing literally all of his teeth. He had a foot deformity from birth. He lived to be 45 years old, which means that for 45 years in the wilderness without an anything that we consider a modern luxury, his community showed up. They chewed his food for him. They walked for him. They hunted for him. They brought him everything he needed. And what that means is he was loved. And that's what it is when we come down to it, you know? You can look at a Neanderthal from 50,000 years ago and see that he was loved. Love will make it. Thank you. I'm done now, I promise. <laughs>
Thanks, Alex. I'm 149. Actually, we can have a full presentation about like what it actually means to build community and like organizing yeah. that stuff. Cause I was like, there's so many thoughts about that. I'd uh, love to chat with you about them. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Thank you. But, 